Hi there, I'm Frank Sandor, author of Migrant Origins, now in its second edition, available from Amazon and most major booksellers. The second edition contains far more research and fills some of the gaps that were present in the first edition. The purpose of this video is not to explain my theories in full, but instead is intended to show potential readers what they might find should they intend to buy this book. I did this video using slides off the internet to show people that my theories are based on mainstream research and isn't just a fringe theory. I state from the very beginning that I believe in the Ehrlich theory in that Hungarian and Finnish and Estonian and Mansi are all related languages. What I do not believe in is the 19th century notion that the Ehrlich languages originated east of the Ural Mountains. That part is not verifiable. Hungarian being related to Finnish and Estonian, that is verifiable and testable. The proto ehrlich language, that is held on to with a belief system almost akin to holding on to a religion. So let's start by going to University of Toronto and seeing what they have to say about the age of the Hungarian language. If you scroll down the page, you'll notice that they say that the Hungarian language is between 2,500 to 3,000 years old. Now this is a very important date because a lot was happening in Asia 2,500 to 3,000 years ago. If we go to Universalium, an online dictionary, it shows that the Ehrlich languages are estimated to be between 7,000 to 10,000 years old as a group. The Hungarian language is much younger. Now, that age range I have seen age anywhere from 7,000 to 13,000 years, but that window of 7,000, 10,000 years ago, that is a very critical date because that is where the Uralic language theory and the proto uralic language falls apart. And for those people who complain that I'm pronouncing it Uralic instead of Uralic, I say tomato, you say tomato. The next site I went to is called Knowles 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 Family Association. It's just a random genetic site I picked. You can verify this information on any other genetic site. But if you scroll down on their page, you'll see that they talk about haplogroup N. Haplogroup N is the genetic group that traces the migration of Ehrlich speakers um, and the Finnish and Estonians and Mansi across from uh, Siberia into uh, Europe. Hungarians do not carry this marker, except in very small trace amounts, which means Hungarians are not simply just an offshoot of the other Ehrlich speakers. There's something else going on. Um, but let's get back to this marker that traces the uh, migration of uh, Finns and Estonians. That marker arose in uh, Siberia around 10,000 years ago. If we go back to the age of the so-called proto ehrlich language, they're estimating it to be around 10,000 years. Here's the interesting part. They're saying the language developed coincidentally at the same time these people arrived in the area. But let's take a step back. Where were these people just before they arrived in Siberia? If you look at this uh, page here, it says, um, it's a member of Eurasian clan who traveled through the north, through the Pamir Knot. The Pamir Knot is where the Hindu Kush, the Pamir Mountains, and the Chien Chien Mountain ranges meet, just north of India, um, near Pakistan. And so this has those the people who spoke the proto ehrlich language, as uh, it's called, coming from just north of India, a lang an area rich in languages, but somehow the traditional linguist theory wants to say they had no influence on the Ehrlich languages. They apparently spoke nothing, migrated to uh, Siberia, and formed their own language in isolation of the rest of the world. And any words that happen to be similar between the, the Indian languages and the Ehrlich languages, well, that's just by coincidence. So now going to the question specifically about Hungarians. Now, if you remember, I said that Hungarians do not carry the haplogroup N, which uh, marks that migration of the Ehrlich speakers in the north. What, so what do Hungarians carry? Well, geneticists have found that Hungarians carry um, the haplogroup P, uh, M45, in small quantities. This is not a northern marker. This is actually a marker found in southern Central Asia. And they also found that Hungarians were extremely high in haplogroup J. Uh, 
And they go on to speculate possible uh, causes for this because the geneticists, using the existing theories of where Hungarians came from near the Ural Mountains, there is no explanation as to why haplogroup J is so high among Hungarians. In order to narrow down where the possible causes for uh, this high amount of J uh, is from, we first need to determine what type of J it is. And if we go to the family tree DNA site, we see that those people who are being tested to determine what type of J they have, they're testing for J2A. Now knowing that the type of J is J2A, if we go to the DNA ancestry page, we see that J2A subclad is present in the Middle East and South Central Asia, the latter of which includes India and Nepal. In India there is a general trend for increased J2A frequency in higher castes. It has been also found in Crete. So once again, not in the north, where traditionally we're told that's where Hungarians are from. So let's take a step back and uh, recap. So we know that uh, the main Uralic migration of uh, the n Happel group came uh, from the area of the Hindu Kush and Premier Mountains around the time that the so-called Proto-Uruk language was forming. Then if we look at Hungarians, we see the exact same thing, but much later in time. We see hung Hungarians having haplogroups that are found in the Pamir and Hindu Kush region, and then migrating into Siberia, acquiring a small amount of that northern and uh, genetic material, meaning they didn't spend very long there. Um, so they migrated up from Central Asia into Siberia, and then quickly moved across uh, into Europe. So if Hungarians were living in southern Central Asia, what was going on 2,500 to 3,000 years ago that would possibly trigger the introduction of a new language? Well, one of the significant events we have is Ionians and Greeks moving into eastern Persia. These Ionians and Greeks, these are the people responsible for the spread of the haplogroup J2A that we see spreading throughout uh, southern Central Asia. Um, not all of them would have stayed within their community. Others would have left there, continued the migration eastward, possibly moving into the Hindu Kush. We also had Alexander the Great coming through um, a little later and destroying these uh, people who had previously settled because they had for forgotten how to speak Greek. Those people either would have been killed or they would have had to have fleed. Where would they have fleed to? They would have fleed into the nearby Hindu Kush mountains for protection. And then what was going on in the region of the Hindu Kush? Well, significant event at that time period is Vedic Hinduism becoming Buddhism. You have a displaced people possibly acquiring a new religion. That is the motivation for learning new language. You cannot learn Buddhism without being able to read the Sanskrit literature. Forget everything that you've ever heard about Hungarians being shamanistic when they arrived in Europe. It served a 19th century purpose of showing Hungarians as primitive barbarians, but it simply has no basis in fact. The old Hungarian writing was destroyed, not because they didn't like the look of the characters, but because they wanted to destroy the memory of the old religion. This event in history tells us that Hungarians had religious texts. They were not shamanistic. Shamanism oral by nature. All of those symbols that people claim are symbols of shamanism are actually Vedic Hindu symbols taken out of context. Let's use the sun and the moon for example. You can't simply say Hungarians worship the sun and the moon. You have to look at how did they use it in their iconography. What did those symbols mean to them? then you can compare that to other religions. So let's take a look at this uh, 13th century Hungarian coin, for example. So right off the bat, the first thing we can deduce from this coin is Hungarians were not worshipping the sun and the moon as deities. There is not a Christian alive today or back then who would have allowed deities to appear above the image of Christ. That violates the Ten Commandments, thou shall have no other gods. It has the Christian cross, the deity in the center, and on one side it has the uh, sun, and on the other side it has the moon. It's not just a regular crescent moon. If you look closely at how they drew it, it's got a circle next to the crescent moon. That symbol, the, the, circle, the circle in the moon, 
is called a Dharma moon. It's the sun and the moon merged together into a single symbol. And the symbol of the Dharma moon, used in the same context as on this Hungarian coin, to the left and right of the deity, is only found in one religion. And that's the religions that have evolved from Vedic Hinduism, like Buddhism and Hinduism. You do not find it anywhere else. Even in Egypt, where they merge the sun and the moon together into a symbol, it is not used in the same context of left and right in the deity. Here we see on a Buddhist coin from Nepal, the Dharma moon on the left and the sun on the right. And on this Buddhist coin from Tibet, we see the crescent moon on the left and the sun on the right. That's how they distinguish their Buddhism from the Buddhism in Nepal by drawing their sun and moon just slightly differently. On the stamp from Nepal, we see the Dharma moon on the left and the sun on the right. The lion in the middle is a symbol for Buddha. And on this coin from uh, India, we see the same thing that we see on Hungarian coins, with the sun on the left and the moon on the right. And this particular coin, they symbolize the sun with the wheel and the moon with the conch. But that's how we can determine what region Hungarians acquired Buddhism in, is by which side of the deity they place the sun and the moon. The sun and the moon also representing male and female aspects of the deity. Nepal and Tibet placing them on opposite sides than they do in India. So, we have Hungarians practicing form of Buddhism, acqu probably acquired closer to India than to Nepal. And DNA evidence puts both the Hungarians and the main body of Ehrlich speakers in the Hindu Kush region as their languages are being developed. The Sanskrit must be considered as the parent for the Ehrlich languages. So, this idea that we had refugees adopting Vedic Hinduism and having to learn Sanskrit so that they could read the religious texts gives us the, the basis for how Hungarian evolved from the language of Sanskrit. It's not based on direct adoption, so it's not based on a word just slowly changing over time. It's based on the idea of phonetic errors, the same errors that you see when children learn to speak or when a non-native speaker tries to learn a new language. They create errors in pronunciation that affect not individual letters, but whole groups of sounds. When Hungarians were learning Sanskrit, one of the things that happened is they weren't learning direct word equals word adaptations. They were learning concepts. So they would adopt the conceptual meanings of words to be their words, such as the Sanskrit word for water became the Hungarian word for duck. And we also saw the phonological errors occurring. And I'm just gonna briefly gonna go through it. Some of those phonological errors are, it is not limited to just these errors. There are many more and I go into detail in my book. One of the things that happened was that sounds were reduced to only one or two syllables. As words were being shortened, sounds also tended to move forward in the mouth. There are some instances where sounds move backwards, but those are very rare. Another thing that happened was that sounds could shift within their own class. S's can come, become Z's, K's can become G's, G's can become K's, Z's can become S's. And finally, Sanskrit has a lot of letters that are accompanied by the letter H. These are not pronounced together, such as PH isn't pronounced F, it's pronounced P. Hungarian loses those extra sounds, so it tries to minimize the effort, and the, the, the letter that is retained is the one that has the more, most emphasis. And this brings us to the end. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Once again, it is not meant as a complete explanation of my theory, but rather a sampling of what you'll find inside the book. It was Major Origins, second edition.